Hi, everyone. How's it going? Welcome to episode 30, or sorry, welcome to episode 65 of Maine Politics. It's good to see everybody in here. How's everybody doing today? Looks like uh, a lot of familiar faces are in here today. Welcome, everybody. Um, today, my it, I don't know if you guys heard my news on the last episode, but um, today it's going to be slightly different um, from previous episodes of the show where I actually have a subject I wanted to talk about today. It's not something that's necessarily in the news right now. It's not really headlines. Um, and of course, you guys are welcome to participate. Uh, but probably while I'm doing the first part of the podcast, while I'm telling this story, uh, I won't be paying too much attention to the chat. Um, so if you want to catch my attention, uh, wait until the second half. I'll definitely be interacting more. Um, so today the game uh, that I wanted to play for you guys is called Nom 1975. It's by SNK, uh, the makers of the Neo Geo. It came out for the Neo Geo console, also the Neo Geo MVS arcade system, which was a cartridge-based multiple select arcade system that Neo Geo put out, which was ad identical to their console hardware. Um, hey, Furious, how's it going? Um, so... And uh, part of the reason I picked this game is because, as I've long told you guys since I've been doing this show, there are a shitload of weird, like, pro-Vietnam War games. Um, most of them Japanese-made. And if you actually see this game, like, through its entirety, it makes no sense. I mean, you're fighting against jet planes, helicopters, basically things that the Viet Cong didn't have. Um, you're like fighting like a high-tech army in this game. It's really stupid. It's actually really odd um, how much full speech dialogue there is like at the beginning of this game. Let me just show you a little example. Um, so check this out. This is the whole intro attract screen for this game. It's very strange. I just want you guys to listen to this before we get started. Summer, 1975. A nightmare awaits me. I am being recalled to Nam Torm headquarters. Do I have to go back to the hell again? Okay, so that's um, that's the uh, that's the splash intro attract screen. I don't know if it's a mistranslation or how that was read, but he says, I, I, do I have to go back to the hell, the hell again? If you actually look at the text, it says, I, do I have to go back to this hell again? The voiceover sounds really muffled and weird and it's so bad sounding. It almost makes the game seem cheap. Like usually speech in games from this era, like elevates it, like makes it sound like, Oh shit, that's crazy. This game has like full, no digitized speech, but um, it's a weird, weirdly poorly done uh, speech, digitized speech for a video game. Sounds like he's talking into one of those, remember those old PC microphones um, that you'd get with like an old multimedia computer? It sounds like he's talking into one of those. I don't understand it. Um, so yeah, dumb game aside, I will be playing this game a little bit, but while I'm playing this game or before before it, I just wanted to tell you guys a little story about the history of the Berkeley protest movement. Um, I think a lot of people maybe who either didn't live through the 60s or who have a cursory knowledge of the protest movement during the 60s thinks of it as mostly a Vietnam War protest. A lot of hippies you know, free love, um, things like that. Uh, the history is quite interesting, and I think it's a lot more complicated than people realize. And uh, it actually has a lot of interesting parallels to what's going on right now. Um, 
so you know this Chaz, this autonomous zone in Seattle that everyone's on the right is freaking out about. You know that Trump thinks is like a Antifa takeover or something like that. Um, it has precedence in this country. Um, there is still aspects of holdover movements from the 1960s and 70s that still have ripple effects today in a similar way that that autonomous zone in Seattle does. And specifically what I'm talking about is the Berkeley People's Park uh, protests and the movement and what became People's Park, which maybe seems like a kind of a superficial or not like an important thing to be like I, I remember when I first went to Berkeley I didn't understand the significance of People's Park I thought it was just some sort of communal thing that the city sort of kept their hands out of you know to let the people use I didn't understand the history of it and how symbolic and important it was for the protest movement for the anti-war movement for the free speech movement for the Black Panther movement everything it sort of culminated into People's Park um, which maybe seems strange that it would sort of culminate into something so small and that's really not like a famous thing we hear about now. But what it sort of revealed to everybody is that um, the government was not fucking around in terms of being able to use whatever force they found necessary to stifle, to destroy, to demoralize these protest movements that they could. And that's the lesson that people learn from that. Um, so let me just start with, um, you know, some early history here. I mean, I think I, even I had this misrepresentation of the 1960s that it was, you know, mostly hippies, um, people with like long hair, facial hair, a lot of like hippies, uh, you know, protesting the war, doing these the street activism stuff. Um, I think that perception is very ahistorical, actually, once you sort of unpack what happened, how this really all evolved, and how the hippies and the activist movement didn't really join forces until the late 60s. The activist movements were going very, very strong in Berkeley specifically in the early 60s up until the point where they sort of joined with the hippie movement and there was cross uh, influence. Um, you know, when you think of Berkeley being sort of this epicenter of protest energy um, or the protest movements, I think, you know, we have this idea that, I don't know what idea that people have. I don't know what I'm talking about. But I don't think we, we remember that, um, Oh, shit. Well, wow, that's crazy. Michael, I didn't hear about that. Well, I guess that's the end of that. Um, but most people who go to Berkeley are affluent. Um, they come from well-to-do families, middle to upper class people. That's what makes up the mostly the student body at Berkeley. Especially, actually, that's what mostly made it up back then um, during that time period. Mostly white affluent middle to upper class people came from middle to upper class families that it was the makeup of the student body so when you hear this criticism now where it's like oh, all these white anarchists or all these white leftists you know trying to co-opt like black issues or you know all, it's just all these white people um that actually sort of fits a similar model to what happened in uh the 1960s including when those same activists joined up and had solidarity with the Black Panthers in the later 60s. So uh, what I'm about to tell you is early, you know, there were some early civil rights actions that were spurred on by these white student groups um, to try to push the issue of civil rights and things like that and, and many other issues. So and, and for anybody who hasn't seen it, there's actually a really good movie um, Politically speaking, it's a little bit the, the sort of the narrative framing of it is that like we thought we had a revolution on our hands. We were wrong. We were naive. We were, you know, stupid. And then, the, you know, the system sort of crushed us. Um, while that's partly, you know, 
true in a lot of ways. Uh, I think that the movie is perhaps not as optimistic and like rev like adopting sort of the revolutionary spirit as I think that another movie covering a similar thing could be. But regardless of the sort of the political point of view in the actual movie, I think that the movie is a really, really good historical overview of what happened in the 60s, specifically in Berkeley. Um, and uh, I recommend everybody to watch it. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is stuff you've probably already heard about if you have seen that movie or you're probably already familiar with it. So, so this kind of all started, I mean, the movie at least portrays it this way. And I'm sure that it started, you know, it had a more nuanced or complicated beginning. But the first major, like, newsworthy outpouring of, st of Berkeley or local California college student activists uh, doing a major protest um, was at in San Francisco City Hall they had a House of Un-American Activities Committee session at San Francisco City Hall I don't know why it was held there specifically but what happened was the hall was flooded with students uh, essentially protesting McCarthyism and protesting the House of Un-American Activities Committee now uh, local police came in with batons. Um, they started beating people. And uh, this is like one of the first instance, instances you see on video of American protesters doing like the going limp civil disobedience thing where they're just like, fuck this, I'm not going to move. And then they make the police drag them out. So back then, the police were so upset at these protesters for coming into City Hall. And they're actually very peaceful. If you watch the videos, they just came in. Uh, joined up with the audience. They didn't throw anything. They weren't even yelling anything, really. Um, they start singing the Star Spangled Banner, I guess, as some expression of patriotism, which I don't, you know, kind of is gross to me, but that's what the protesters decided to do to show, you know, that that's the real patriotism versus the House of um, Un American Activities Committee. So what happened was the cops were trying to drag these people out one by one, you know, and they were all going limp. So what they did is they literally brought in a fire hose into City Hall and like blasted the protesters like down the stairs with the fire hose. And there's a there's there's a lot of video of it. It's pretty comical. Everyone's soaking wet. Um, and yeah, that that protest was such a big deal um, and so and made such a splash that um, there was an actual propaganda movie made by people who are sympathetic to the House of Un-American Activities Committee called Operation Abolition. Um, uh, Susan. <laughs> hey, Mom. What's going on? Uh, the movie's called Berkeley in the 60s. I've told you to watch it before, years ago. You probably forgot. Um, the vol Is the volume low? What's Why is it low? Check, check. Oh, here's why it's low. Sorry. It's better now. Is this better for everybody now? Sorry about that. JC, did I fix it? Did I fix the issue? Please tell me. Well, I'll just continue on with my rant. Um, so... You can actually watch this film in its entirety. It's a propaganda film called Operation Abolition, and it was made in response to the protesters flooding City Hall. And this film is essentially, it's like a cartoonish, ridiculous version of like what a lot of these like right-wingers try to do now. Say that there's like a secret, con you know, like the CCP the Chinese Communist Party is somehow controlling the Black Lives Matter protest. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen any of this stuff, but there's a fringe offshoot of neocons who are not friends with Bill Kristol and Robert Kagan anymore who are determined to say that everything happening right now in America that feels destabilizing is by China. Well, Operation Abolition um, was essentially doing the same thing, but back then the, the worldview was that the Communist Party 
was like a worldwide conspiracy that it wasn't just like Russia and China and these individual communist countries. It was like a worldwide plot to destroy the world. And in this Ap Operation Abolition movie, they actually show the students um, who flooded City Hall and they, they show pictures of them, you know, actual archive footage of these students in City Hall peacefully protesting, calling them hardcore communist agents, like literally. Like the movie is like this hardcore communist uh, infiltrator agent is here to disrupt. Like it's like, you know, nowadays, like the, these sort of right wingers will allude to it. But like this video is actually like literally calling like regular protesters, like hardcore communist agents. Um, and in the in the movie, there's an actual quote as they're showing these student protesters. So they're trying to have it both ways. They say. uh they say, you will see revealed the longtime communist tactic in which a relatively few well-trained hardcore communist agents are able to incite non-communists to do the dirty work of the communist party. Um, so that's how the, the people who were sympathetic to McCarthyism at the time saw these protesters. Anyone protesting McCarthyism was automatically a, a literal communist agent. Like, that's how fucking stupid crazy and paranoid the propaganda was at the time this is 1960 i mean this is not the 50s anymore yeah if life is a leaf you're right there was a big component of that i mean that's why um that's why they went to city hall and that's why they felt that they had the right to do that. Um, the public property does belong to the people. It was also a similar philosophy to the, why the black Panthers actually went to Capitol Hill or wait, not Capitol Hill. Um, the state Capitol, uh, building later, which I'm going to get into that as well. So there were actual in 1960, there were actual like McCarthyist, like right wing students at Berkeley, and they promoted the film Operation Abolition to try to like smear activists at Berkeley for being communists. Now, some UC Berkeley students screened the film and the film itself was protested. Um, people stood up and interrupted the film. Now. It's it's fascinating because what this film did is it actually inspired tons of Berkeley students to want to become protesters because they saw how like I think what they sensed was similar to the situation now they saw from that movie that it reeked of fear if these psychotic right wing anti communists were willing to go as far as saying that these student peaceful protesters were hardcore communist agents then they were scared as shit to have to go that far to smear peaceful protesters that that reeks of fear so what these berkeley students did is they they saw that video actually as an inspiration that wow so this is how scared they are of this shit well that's pretty awesome let's fuck shit up so that's kind of what they did i mean that that's that film had a really big impact is what i'm saying and and you can still watch it it's called operation abolition i would recommend you watch it if you just want to see an example of a really cartoonish McCarthyistic kind of a film. It's still out there. And, you know, in the early sixties, UC Berkeley administration was openly hostile to any form of political activism, any student groups trying to do political activism and leafleting uh, and they they believed that it was basically they were against students bringing off campus issues, they called it. And that included anything like apartheid in South Africa, racism in the United States, civil rights, anti-war. Um, and basically what happened was there was sort of this creeping effect where as these more activists started popping up in the early 60s in Berkeley, the the administration started to be like punitive towards the students who would who would participate 
they wouldn't outright ban it, but they would be punitive towards them. So, for example, a, a group of graduate students who participated in, in this activism uh, were, were literally kicked off campus as punishment. And they used like a, some kind of other rule, campus rule, to be like, oh, yeah, that's why you were kicked off. But they kicked them off as a punitive measure. So this started to just rile up more anger in the student body because everybody knew that's why these graduate students were kicked off campus. Um, this, nobody believed the administration. And it was like in just like a, a year time period, the entire student body like literally rebelled against the entire administration because of their crackdown efforts against activists. So, so this is just an early example of sort of the white, um, white people and black people joining together to protest against r racial inequality. And this particular civil rights march movement that happened started in 1963 in Berkeley. Um, was arguably started by sort of the white affluent students. Now, what they did was they got together with other black activists and they did sit-ins at local businesses who discriminated against hiring black people. Local businesses in San Francisco, local businesses in Oakland, local businesses in Berkeley. It may be hard to wrap your head around this, but even in 1963, local businesses in the Bay Area were discriminating against black people and they would not hire them. Now, uh, they did a sit-in at the Sheraton Palace Hotel. Um, they wouldn't refuse to leave. They were carrying signs around saying like, this is racist, you know, you don't hire racial minorities, things like that. Um, the police dragged the protesters out of the building by force. Uh, but, the, but what was interesting was even though everybody felt very crushed from this, um, the you know the the law came down very hard. Um, they injured people while dragging them out of the hotel. What happened was <clears throat> the actual arrests and convictions of some of these protesters and their subsequent trials. Uh, they led it actually led to an agreement between the entire hotel industry to end racial discrimination, like pr pretty much out of fear. The hotel industry was worried that there would be more protests against them for not hiring black people. So they actually caved and the hotel industry like agreed to start hiring black people, including into upper positions like management, which was like a shocking thing um, to the protesters at the time that they felt like, wow, like this, this sit in actually had like a genuine effect and moved the needle. And it, it made them feel that they could really have an effect on history. And they were right. I mean, this was another example where a concession was made. People in power got afraid and caved because they didn't want the disruption to continue. They didn't want this kind of attention, negative attention. So... Just a couple of years after this, in 1965, there was so much pressure on UC Berkeley from the business community and the government uh, that they completely banned political free speech on campus. Tabling, flyering, leafleting, uh, soapbox, doing speeches. So at Telegraph and Bancroft, if you've ever been to Berkeley... You'll know that this spot is sort of like the political epicenter of the campus. It faces the street. It faces the public. It's kind of the point. It's not just so that students could, you know, indulge among activism with each other. It was to, it was to spread awareness and to sort of push activism to the general public as well. Now, the campus banned this. They just outright banned it because they realized that the punitive measures they were putting in place were too obvious so I guess they just decided to outright ban it. Um, and if you're not aware of this, the same place that this was banned, uh, this epicenter, is the same place that Mike Cernovich, Milo Yiannopoulos, um, all these alt-right scumbag grifters, that's the same place they go to in Berkeley 
to, to make this political point uh, that they believe in free speech and the left doesn't, right? Um, when in reality, it's really a stunt because they, what, what's interesting is they fully understand the history of the left free speech movement. And instead of saying, you're, you leftists started this movement and now you're turning on it, they're saying that the left is anti-free speech and that the right is pro-free speech. It's not just that they're trying to co-opt the energy and trying to make the left look bad. They're also trying to rewrite history and to own and to sort of remove agency from the fact that the left activist movement, the same left activists that they despise now and would call social justice warrior commies, are the ones who started the shit in the first place, you motherfuckers. And you would know exactly what you're doing. It's a total stunt. But it, sadly, it actually works and it sucks in dumb people who do believe now that the left doesn't believe in free speech and that the right is actually the movement that believes in free speech. It sadly has worked on a lot of like younger, red-pilled kind of idiots. Um, but what's fascinating is, I mean, Mario Savo, the guy who was one of the main proponents of this free speech, I mean, the whole point of it was to fight bigotry, to fight racism, uh, to fight systematic injustice. It's not to, uh, to be hateful towards people. I mean, yeah, technically free speech allows hate speech, but if you go on the Berkeley campus and that's what your goal is to spread hate speech because it's technically free speech, yeah, you're going to get shouted down by people. Um, yeah, people are going to fucking get in your face. That doesn't mean that your free speech rights are being violated. It just means that you're a psychotic asshole who's going into a lion's den Trying to, trying to stir up a hornet's nest on purpose for a stupid issue. And you're a fucking cunt. So um, that shit's really weird that that took off at all in the first place. I mean, I, I find that fascinating. And I wonder whose idea it was to even start doing these right-wing, alt-right things at Berkeley. It seems smart enough where it could have even been like a Steve Bannon ploy. I don't know. Um, Steve Bannon and these other people have definitely studied 60s activism. They know exactly the history of it. They know, they, they understand these things. Um, and they're deliberately distorting the lens of history um, to try to erase left movements. It's a similar, it kind of reminds me of how the right wing has adopted the deep state, which was traditionally always a left wing critique of the systematic sort of national security state. Uh, the right, you know, has taken that term and acts like the left is now the deep state or something. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? No, you guys aren't going to do that. We're not going to let you take that term, you stupid motherfuckers. That's our term. And we're going to keep it. Um, so, so what happened was, after Berkeley banned this in 1965, of course, the students were like, fuck that. This is ridiculous. So they set up tables in the very middle of the campus, um, which is actually the area now where a lot of like political leafleting now happens inside the campus. Uh, the tables, the protesters um, started pouring in. Uh, there was there was I think there was five tables and the police tried to arrest. Um, basically, everybody who was running these tables. They gave them citations. They told them to leave. As soon as they would leave, someone else would come and take their place and then also be given another citation. It was like an act of civil disobedience. There were so many students there that were willing to run these tables that the tables were never empty of anybody running them because every student was willing to get cited or, and or arrested. So what happened was, after five people... so. They got so tired of doing this and handing out all these citations that the administration just announced that we're now just going to be arresting and suspending from the, from the university uh, the five original people who did these tabling. So everybody leave now, go home. And so what happened was uh, a, a student at the time this dean was announcing this, he stood up and he was trying to rouse the crowd and say, no, nobody has to go home. You know, this is ridiculous. He refused to stand down. And uh, the police dr literally drove up through the crowd in a police car, put him in the back of the police car, handcuffed him. And the crowd surrounded the police car and refused to let the police car leave for 30 hours. 
They, they, that's how long the protesters stood there in solidarity with this arrested guy, which is pretty awesome. Um, and what happened was it was sort of like the catalyst for that sort of open mic, you know, street protest thing where he had the microphone originally. Now that the cop arrested him, the microphone just started getting passed around to the crowd and everybody had a three minute slot soapbox to say whatever the hell they wanted to say. And, you know, some people got up and just started like ranting philosophy. Some people got up and started like speaking poetry, even like frat house guys, you know, who were anti the protest started getting up and like, you know, promoting the war and then they would get booed down and like some of them would try to go to the podium and say something and then they wouldn't know what to say. So they would turn away. Um, so the administration of the of the university refused to back down even after this happened. But they did give a false concession to the protesters and saying, we would work this out. We'll figure out a way to do this. You know, we'll give you your free speech. We understand that you need this. Um, so they kind of dragged their feet. They gave this concession to quell the protest. It actually did work because the protesters took them on good faith. Uh, unfortunately, they did. But they waited and waited and nothing happened. The university didn't move anything. They didn't change anything. And so people were like hip to the fact that this was obviously like a trick by the university, you know, to just get the protest to die down. So at this point, um, you may have heard of a famous guy who became famous through the Berkeley activism scene. His name was Mario Savo. He became a really prominent voice in 1964. Um, he's the guy who coined the term and i don't know i'm gonna botch the quote but throw your bodies on the gears he's the guy that coined that term of like this is how you stop the machine you throw your bodies on the gears they so put your body upon the gear that's the actual quote um he gave an extremely impassioned speech on the berkeley campus december 2nd 1964 and he basically um was telling people that this is like an issue that's worth fighting for, worth getting off kicked off campus for, worth getting arrested for, because free speech is one of the most important values that we can hold. Because how else are we going to have these difficult conversations about race, about stopping the war, about stopping police brutality, all this kind of stuff? And you can watch his speech, um, the whole video is online. But it was later revealed and this is not a surprise at all, that this free speech student activist, Mario Savo, um, had been heavily tailed by and surveilled by the FBI uh, for years and years. Um, he never did anything violent. He was never part of any, like, you know, a group that rioted or anything like that. I don't think he was. And he was still considered, like, an extremely threatening activist by the FBI. So that being said... I don't think we should be under any illusions that the FBI and law enforcement agencies aren't doing this now and possibly even doing it on a more sophisticated level. Their surveillance technology is better. Their data mining capability is better. They're probably like monitoring every single activist they can get a picture of. I mean, honestly, if they have the resources to do it, why wouldn't they be? Um, I think we would be naive to think that this is something from the 60s that ended or the 70s and they don't do that anymore. Fuck yeah, they do it, and they probably do it to an even crazier level. Anyone who's gone to any protest, where the, like, especially one where a police car has been turned over, something like that, if you're in the proximity of that and your, camera, your face is on a camera somewhere, you better believe that your name is in a database, you're being surveilled on some level that goes beyond normal surveillance. Um, that's, it just goes with the territory. That's what kind of country we live in. Oh, is it Savio? Thanks, Mom, for the correction. <laughs> um, yeah, 10,000 people arrested the first week of the George Floyd protests. It's fucking crazy. Absolutely crazy. Agent provocateurs then and, and now as well, for sure.
tell the chat a little bit about what you remember about him, mom. Because I don't, I don't, I didn't really know anything about him until watching this movie. Um, but I heard, I definitely had heard his name before. Like his name is famous. So basically the FBI justified the surveillance, of course, because they believed him to be a member of the communist party. So back then, again, the, the law enforcement and the government looked at the communist party as like one sort of like unified fr like conspiracy, which is just sort of bizarre that it was ever seen that way. It's just, it's odd. I, it's hard for me to imagine that that was the world back then because yeah, right wingers talk about communism being threatening now, but they don't talk about it in quite that same way. Like back then it was like a full, like delusional meltdown, like almost like satanic panic level, like psychosis that they got like regular people to take in this McCarthyist mindset that the communist party was sort of this global conspiracy to take over the world and to destroy America. But the FBI at the time decided that uh, the way they were able to justify it, even though the actual FBI agents who were like tailing him and who were surveilling him knew that that was bullshit. They still justified the surveillance because they knew how inspiring he was to the student protest movement. And that's the whole point. That was the whole point. It's not that he was a communist agent or anything. All that stuff is just wallpaper for them to justify things. It was because he was very influential and uh, he, could, he could start shit up. And he did. So this is interesting, too. The FBI tried to do a sneaky, weird thing with him where they were like, hey, Mario, we got some death threats coming in for you. You're going to need to come into our office and uh, talk about them. We, we, we want to protect you. You're getting death threats. And so he was just like, OK, I'll, I'll come in with my lawyer. And they're like, no, you're not allowed to bring your lawyer. <laughs> like, so he was smart enough to know that the FBI was probably like trying to entrap him or do something very odd in that situation. And he was just like, no, fuck you. I'm not going in without my lawyer, you fucking sneaky motherfuckers. <laughs> and he didn't. Um, obviously, they, I don't know what they were trying to pull, but to be like, hey, you got death threats. Can you come in for a second? We want to talk to you. But no, 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 your lawyer can't. You just need to come in by yourself. I mean, it's obvious trick. Never talk to your, the police without a lawyer. Any of those, um, those like marijuana activist videos will tell you that. Um. Mom, I have a question for you about that. Because at this time, in the, in the early 60s, like Mario Savo era, this was like pre the hippie protest movement. This was like when the just was mostly students. So when you were watching the news back then, do you remember the news trying to characterize all these students as like dirty hippies who were, who were just rabble rousers and doing drugs and having sex? Or did they actually characterize them as just like, students like petulant students i mean obviously i know there was a negative characterization but it seemed to have moved from these are just like petulant ungrateful children telling us how to change society to like these are dirty hippies who just want to do drugs and have free love and these lazy hippies who don't want to work um what did that transition take place So just an example of what kind of information they collected from Savio. Collected without a court order, this is in Wikipedia, personal information from schools, telephone companies, utility firms, and banks, compiled information about his marriage, his divorce, monitored his day-to-day -day activities by using informants planted in political groups, covertly contacting his neighbors, landlords, and employers, and having agents pose as professors, journalists, and activists to interview him and his wife. So that's an interesting thing. So if you're ever doing any like really radical shit and there's some like sketchy journalist who really wants to interview you and you don't understand why, think back to this story, okay? 
Think back to this story. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, all this stuff, they didn't have a court order to do it, but they did it anyways. You know, some of the church committee revelations were about this, how they just did all this shit, you know, totally like Wild West style. The FBI would just like spy on everybody they found a threat without the really the legal authority to do it. I mean, that's was kind of the point of the church committee. So they actually surveilled and heavily trailed Mario Savio for 10 years. Nobody knows exactly how expensive the FBI investigation was into him, but that's a 10 year long investigation with that many people involved that I just labeled to. That's got to be millions and millions of dollars. That's kind of hilarious that they couldn't do anything to him eventually. Who knows what would have happened, though, if he went into the FBI without his lawyer? I mean, that was obviously some kind of setup. JC, encrypted messaging is an interesting thing. It's the intercept and, and you know, Glenn Greenwald's preferred, I guess, way of dealing with surveillance. You know, actually, but even, here's the interesting thing. If you watch Citizen 5, Snowden puts his phone inside of a Tupperware container at a, at a point. He put Or he puts their phones inside of a Tupperware container. That's an interesting thing from the movie because it shows that even Snowden knows that ultimately like encrypted technology on a phone is fucking bullshit. All they have to do, I mean, if you were already targeted specifically for surveillance, all you have to do is have a backdoor software installed on your phone to just look at your screen. It doesn't matter what encrypted anything you have going on because they can look exactly like what's happening on your screen. If you're talking to someone on signal thinking that you're hidden... Why would you think that, like, I mean, even the Israeli government is putting backdoor Trojan horse programs on people's cell phones. So why would you think that an encrypted chat would somehow stop that? If you're already. Oh, was it a microwave? I don't remember. I thought it was Tupperware. OK, I must have forgotten. So basically what I'm saying is if you're doing something really, really sensitive and you're already being targeted you would be an idiot to think that an encrypted chat would save you. Unless you're using a burner cell phone of some kind. A, like a burner with nothing to trace you to it. A lot of people are dumb with the way they go about burners. You actually will watch, and my mom will know exactly what I'm talking about because she watches a ton of ID network. Uh, that burner cell phones, people fuck up all the time trying to cover their tracks with burners. They'll buy a burner like a Radio Shack with their credit card. Although be on the surveillance camera, you know, with the burner. It's like the whole point of a burner is it's supposed to be anonymous. You buy it in cash, even maybe even wear a disguise when you buy one. Don't put any of your real information in a burner. Um, if you're using a burner, don't use one right after you've used your actual cell phone in the same location. That's a dead giveaway. I mean, there's these basic things. So there are things... Yeah, maybe encrypted chat on a burner with total an anonymity that you've covered your tracks entirely is okay. Other than that, no, it's not. And even in that instance, what if there's a backdoor thing installed on the burner? Then they can read your encrypted chat, just like I was saying from before. So ultimately, it's kind of a wash. Um, but I do think... If you're if you're doing any like low level misdemeanors or anything like that, like say like I would assume if you're let's say if you deal drugs, you know, illegal drugs. If you have signal and that's how you're communicating with your customers or your fellow drug dealers, it would be harder for the court to use those records in court in the case against you because the messages either delete automatically, they're encrypted, 
if you're being surveilled remotely, the only way they would be able to be used against you in court is if they're saved on your cell phone or there are screenshots of them. That's it. So that, unless someone had a sophisticated way of decrypting it, I think you would have to be more in government, like threatening the government territory at that point to get that. Or you'd have to be targeted for another crime if you're threatening the government. So for example, what happened to Matt DeHart may have been something like that. He may have been a whistleblower that found some stuff that was really threatening to the government and they figured out a way to pin some kind of sex crime charge against him, you know, in some other way by surveilling him with targeted surveillance. I don't know what happened there. Um, but regardless, if you think Matt DeHart did it or not, it's almost beside the point because it's like he was obviously targeted. What he did is it's strange that he would have just been na nabbed for that if you look into the details. So that's an interesting one to look at, I think. Uh, Joe, I'm talking about the movie uh, Berkeley in the 60s. Sweet nugs. Yes, I did see the Howard Stern blackface clip. And I had already seen that. Like, I don't know why anybody is surprised that Howard Stern would be wearing blackface and doing like a minstrel theater sketch. His whole show was designed to be as non-politically correct and as offensive as possible. That's how he got famous. I mean, yeah, I was, I mean, I thought, I think it's disgusting and stupid. Um, but it, I mean, like it's not nothing about it surprising to me. I mean, I, I feel like I've definitely seen that clip somewhere. Somebody, that I used to know um, used to have all those pay-per-view Howard Stern specials. And they are always like really, I mean, offensive in a lot of ways, like stuff he couldn't say on the radio back then in the early eighties, what seemed like un PC was like homophobia and racism, you know, like Andrew Dice Clay kind of stuff. Um, If life is a leaf, uh, they used to do overt surveillance as intimidation. Yes, that's, there's an actual name for that. It's called bumper lock surveillance. It's designed to intimidate you. And in some instances, actual academics who have studied the FBI will, will say that in some instances, it's not just designed to intimidate you. It's designed to wear you down mentally to the point of actual suicide. And uh, the FBI has actually driven multiple people to suicide th this way via bumper lock surveillance and intimidation. That is a tactic they have used and then has worked in the past. Um, that, and as you know, they tried to get MLK idiotically. If you read their little stupid letter, they tried to send to MLK. It's the weakest bullshit ever. They tried to get him to commit suicide because he was having sex. You know, he was just getting a lot of ass. And he, rep he presented himself as being this like puritanical Christian family man. So the FBI thought that he would have such a moral conundrum by them revealing the fact that he was tearing it up as a means to get him to commit suicide. It didn't work. They were fucking dumb. Um, stupid. Stupid move on their part. It didn't work. So they probably likely had to figure out a way to kill them. Kill him. Which they did through a convoluted scheme. Okay, so let's continue on with the uh, story. So this is when everything kind of hit critical mass. In 1965, on December 2nd, um, around 4,000 students went into Sproul Hall in Berkeley as a last resort um, to open negotiations with the administration on free speech because... The administration like basically quelled the previous protest by saying we concede free speech is allowed now. 
you can do this. We'll, we'll tell you how shortly. They never did. Obviously, it was a lie. So they, they literally occupied this hall. Um, this, this, the, the demonstration was actually very peaceful. You know, they were singing like Kumbaya in the halls. Um, Joan Baez actually was there. Uh, to like sing songs with the protesters. Um, there was actual classes held for the protesters who occupied one of the lecture rooms in the hall. Uh, they called them freedom classes. So as you can see, this is kind of getting a little bit into the territory of the Chaz Autonomous Zone in Seattle. We're sort of getting, it's feeling occupy-ish. These things all have their roots in this Berkeley uh, political movement. Uh, Mario Savio gave a speech on the steps of Sproul Hall uh, wall. It was being occupied. Now, uh, the police, of course, came uh, that night and uh, they gave them the authority to mass arrest everybody in the building. And about 18 or sorry, about 800 students uh, were arrested and they all did the same thing that the students in um, the House of Un-American Activities uh, City Hall protested as they learned, you know, none of them, these were all unexperienced activists. This is all like really new. So they were taught by like Mario Savio and these other people like go limp. If the cops come and get you, you go limp. Don't fight. Don't try to run away. You just go limp in solidarity and you refuse to move. And so that's sort of what they did again. And it was a symbolic gesture. There's videotape of them being dragged out, going limp. Um, and uh, they were actually all transported to Santa Rita Jail, um, about 25 miles away, which is the same place that, like, the uh, you know Occupy Oakland protesters go to now. So, eventually, um, the university tried to punish these students who started this protest, uh, and they actually brought charges against them. So this resulted in an even larger protest that actually shut down the entire university. So there was an academic Senate at the time, and I don't know how it got to this point exactly. The movie doesn't make this clear, but the debate about if free speech would be allowed on the Berkeley campus, it eventually moved to the, uh, the UC Senate, the Senate body. And the Senate body voted overwhelmingly in support of the student movement and said that they need to have an outlet for free speech. So I'm just going to take a break from the story for a second and just see if there's anything in the chat you guys wanted to, t to mention before I continued. Tara Toddler says to think that things got somewhat better after the Kennedy Kennedy coup is not being intellectually honest. Um, I think that we saw a lot of activism and momentum building after that, even beyond Martin Luther King's assassination. I think people, and even I am probably guilty of this because I probably said this on the podcast many times that, there was this like mass disillusionment and like that the revolution was sort of over after Kennedy, you know, RFK was killed, MLK was killed. That's not necessarily true. It was crushed. The police basically just used more overwhelming and like scarier and more intimidating force to crush the protest movement. And that's sort of what happened. That's what actually caused the disillusionment. It was almost like people realized that they, they dehumanized protesters to the point where they thought that, that, that eventually the army was going to treat the protesters like the Viet Cong, like an enemy force. Um, that was what people thought. And instead of making people 
want to fight even harder. I think it eventually just like sort of crushed their soul that it's almost like maybe, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe it would have been good to talk to someone who, you know, I, I live like right near all, where all this stuff happened. So maybe, maybe I'll bring someone on who was like involved in these protests um, to sort of comment on what's going on now. And, and what was it that caused the amount of disillusionment where it was sort of like, you know, the dream of the revolution ended. True. If life is a leaf says not everyone was into nonviolence, SDS and Weatherman blew up Berkeley Draft Center and occupied counterterrorism at Stanford. If life is a leaf, when was the Weatherman bombing of the Berkeley Draft Center? Because I'm going I haven't gotten to the late sixties yet. I'm still on sixty five. And I think that what you're talking about happened around the same time that things did that that the that the actual student activists weren't necessarily encouraging violence, but they were saying that civil disobedience is no longer going to work and that um sort of non-violence is no longer going to work while they weren't directly encouraging violence there was a, fl a tipping point at a certain point where the berkeley students actually would openly express the need um to raise the stakes because they understood that that was the only way they were going to get the needle moved um but this movie actually doesn't go into the weatherman at all so that aspect isn't covered it doesn't really go into much beyond California and the Berkeley protest movement. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to cover that at a certain point. I mean, I, I would like to learn more about the weathermen and those kinds of uh, sort of tactics. So this is where uh, in 1965, Vietnam Day at uh, UC Berkeley was sort of the first major event um, that brought the war as a sort of an issue, a forefront issue for the student protest movement. Because so they had already gotten a victory with free speech, which was really just a vehicle to push other more important issues to begin with. The reason they died on this hill for free speech is because they wanted to push other issues like ending McCarthyism, you know, that was one of their big things uh, in the first place. And now that sort of the McCarthy era was sort of fading away, the main thing on everybody's minds right now was the draft um, and the Vietnam War. Now, most college students uh, who are attending UC Berkeley, you already were able to get a deferment if you were actively enrolled in college um, at the time. So people who, there were some exceptions for the draft, and that was one of them. So a lot of the Berkeley students were actually not drafted. Um, but they still brought more attention to ending the draft initially than almost anybody else did. And I'll go into that in a second. So they had this, they, they realized um, that they could use this same power and momentum that they had built up to have an effect on the war. So what they did was one of their first big actions was um, it was a, a pretty daring act of civil disobedience. They found a train that was carting soldiers or recruits from Berkeley to a local army base um, that was going, the train tracks were in Berkeley, I think somewhere near San Pablo Avenue. And these protesters actually sat on the train tracks with anti-war signs and blocked the train. Um, they didn't succeed. Uh, the train uh, actually started to speed up when it rounded the corner to the shock of the protesters. And even some of the police, actually, there, were, there was talk that some of the police were actually surprised. They thought the train was going to stop, too. Um, so, luckily, everybody jumped off the tracks in time. But in the movie, uh, Berkeley in the 60s, a woman recounts seeing a 
anti-war protesters sitting in the lotus position, meditating with her eyes closed in front of the train, right, like right before it's about to hit her. She had to look away and jumped away. And she, she thought that the woman got killed. Like she had no idea how she's able to jump away in time. The woman um, and her randomly ran into each other at a bookstore in Berkeley, like a couple weeks later. And she was like, Oh my God, what happened? Like, how did you manage to get out of there? Um, and the woman's like, Oh, a, a plainclothes police officer grabbed me in the arm and yanked me off the train track at the last minute. And, uh, the woman was like, well, what if he hadn't like, would it, would you have stayed there? And she's like, well, he did. So I didn't have to stay there and not that day, but yeah, if he didn't yank me out there, I would have stayed there. And so even though this woman was already sort of engaged in the protest and she was at this train protest too, she was absolutely shocked and heartened and moved by the fact that somebody, just a random person that was her age, also in Berkeley, was literally willing to die to stand in front of that train to bring attention to the war. And uh, that was a really poignant moment for her. And I think that... Um, it was just an inspiring moment in general, even though they failed this time um, that to see people like literally putting their lives on the line, trying to stop a moving train. And uh, these war protests started to continue. They tried to go down to the Oakland draft center, the local army precinct in Oakland. They would march from Berkeley to Oakland. Oakland kept refusing to give them permits. Of course, the demonstrators were stopped every time they would get down to the, the precinct or the draft center. They would get stopped before. Um, totally peaceful protests. No violence, nothing like that. Um, and a few times later, the Hells Angels actually came in and were just acting like these like crazy brown shirt right wing cunts trying to stop them and like trying to beat up these student protesters. Yes, the same Hells Angels that were those that are typically you know, in the 60s were psychotic gang rapist um, biker gangs. The same ones, um, the same fuckheads that basically like created the Altamont situation that like for a lot of people like ruined the whole image of the 60s where they like, you know, killed someone um, at a rock concert while doing security for the Rolling Stones. That's a whole bizarre story. Um, that I could tell someday on the show, if you haven't heard of the Alt the famous Altamont incident. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know what I, there was some weird affinity between Hell's Angels and hippies to a certain extent, probably because of some of the debauchery and drugs and the autonomous nature or slash collectivist nature, I guess, of each group. Um, but Hunter S. Thomason famously wrote in one of his books, and I'm not sure which book it was, where he had the realization that, you know, the Hell's Angels were basically monsters and they should not be welcomed into the hippie community. Um, and, and it was because he witnessed what he described as basically a gang rape um, by a group of Hell's Angels. Um, and, and right now, actually, it's weird. The Hell's Angels still run a large part of like the medical slash illicit marijuana industry in California up in Humboldt or murder mountain, as they call this area of Humboldt. Um, the hell's angels are basically an organized crime racket that moved from the black market to the medical marijuana community. And, um, it's very strange. I don't really understand how that took place. Oh, the book is the Hell's Angels. Thank you, Voltavin. I didn't. I didn't know that was a title. There's also an interesting video where it's like a debate, or not a debate, but just like a talk show appearance between Hunter S. Thompson and a um, and a Hell's Angel, which is worth watching. So. In 1965, there was a general consensus in this country that, um, that the war pretty much had full bipartisan support. Democrats, Republicans, even young people 
didn't care about the war. Like, even young people who were getting drafted weren't complaining about the war yet. Can you imagine how complacent? Like, if you think, you know, people are saying, like, oh, man, well, I wish we could get back to, like, this, you know, the energy and the vigor of the Vietnam anti-war movement. Well, at first, I mean, for at least a year or two, um, there were people being drafted, young kids into the war who were not saying anything. I mean, that's, like, a really crazy to think about. They were either just totally brainwashed into it or they just thought, well, I have to do this or they were afraid to speak out. Um, and, and at the time, too, the media was still able to portray anyone who opposed the war as basically like a dirty hippie or a communist. Um, but even though this sort of peaceful anti-war march, this tradition against the war that started at Berkeley was mostly conducted by affluent white upper class like students who came from upper class families the, but yet the media was still able to portray people this way even like this the student administration would go and talk to like the news and they'd be like yeah all these people with sandals they're from like out of town they would use the same rhetoric that like trump and even police will use now claiming that like all these agitators for these george floyd protests are from out of town they're like from out of state like um, the UC Berkeley dean would would just say like they're just like these people from out of like hitchhikers with sandals on, who are causing all this ruckus. But when you watch all the video footage, they're all clearly like students, who are like fairly well off people who come from like rich families. It's it's kind of fascinating, um, to see that, and it's it's also fascinating to see that same right wing vitriol going against now like these white, you know, protesters in like Portland and. California, like all these kids, these like millennials or, you know, they all have iPhones and they all come from like, you know, rich parents or whatever. Like, what do they have to complain about? I remember that was like the Occupy thing, the Occupy complaint. It's a similar sort of complaint now um, that you hear about these protesters. But yet the inception of this very important protest movement has very similar parallels there were very few people of color at Berkeley uh, protesting the war at the time. I mean, look at the video. It's all mostly all white faces. Um, so it's just interesting that that's used as a point against it. Like, oh, they don't really have solidarity with people of color or black people killed, killed by police. It's just sort of like white, you know, white virtue signaling or something. You think all these people are just out there just to uh, flex their wokeness? I mean, that's basically what you're saying, is that it's all just a game. It's just all for points. They want woke points. I mean, like, I will acknowledge it. Like, I don't even want to go to one of these protests right now because I'm still too afraid of getting COVID. So, like, I mean, so, like, a lot of these people must also be afraid of getting COVID, and they're out there protesting. So... I just want you to remember that too. Um, without going down the rabbit hole of being like, why is the media encouraging the protest, but then like shaming, you know, the, the, uh, the anti-lockdown protests and, and stuff like that. It's like that aside, the fact that people are out there protesting to risk their own health, I think is, it says a lot because I'm not willing to do it right now. Joe, yeah, that's correct. N and I just want to make it clear. Not all this started at Berkeley. The reason I'm making it seem like Berkeley was a very important, pivotal part of all this is because it was. But they were not alone. And they had other, there were other college campuses, other movements sort of growing around it. But Berkeley was, in a lot of ways, the engine and sort of the epicenter for a lot of this other stuff that happened. Um and, 
yeah. So I, I just want to, I just want to, yeah, I want to acknowledge that, that I'm not, I hope I'm not trying to say that, um, Berkeley started the Vietnam war protest. That is not, not correct. What they did rather was they folded in an already very strong and sort of established and seasoned student activist movement that had started in the early sixties. They folded in the Viet the, the Vietnam war, the anti-war cause into that and built it in and started battling with police in the streets and rioting, just like, um, you know, what would happen in the late sixties. And, and I'm going to go into that a little bit right now. So, if you watch the speech of Reagan at the uh, RNC convention for the governor race of uh, 1966, he uses the hatred of Berkeley activists and hippies to rile up his base. Um, and that's part of how he rode into office. Um, he actually specifically spent a portion of his speech at the convention saying that uh, UC Berkeley allowed an activist rock and roll concert with psychedelic colors and pictures of naked people um, gyrating on the screen. And that was his main complaint about it. That was what he used at the convention speech to rile up the audience the most. I mean, it's just kind of crazy to think back to 1966. That alone would have been like enough to scare people. Um, but you should watch videos of him in like 66, like, the guy's a really aggressive neocon cunt. I mean, he didn't become like a senile ghost until the 80s. I mean, you, you have to watch him in the 60s and as governor to understand like why he was such a valuable tool for like the basically the deep state at the time. You know, everyone's like, oh, Reagan's a anti-globalist. He's a nationalist. It's like this weird rewriting of history by these Roger Stone pieces of shit. Um, no, he was a total... He was like one of the most perfect, refined tools the deep state ever had for like multiple decades. You'd have to be an idiot to not see that. Or you just have to have like a weirdly rewritten version of history, like, you know, because you got sucked into the maggot chud thing a little bit. I'm sorry, but you did if you think Reagan was some kind of a nationalist. I mean, and I'm not even saying nationalist is a good thing. I mean, it's not a good thing. It's a terrible thing to be a nationalist. Um, but I think Reagan was, wasn't a nationalist. He was just a part of the deep state. So at this point, I mean, the fact that like Reagan sort of solidified this notion, the fact that even the Democrats and the mainstream media, the fact that even the dean of the university was saying that everybody was from out of state, dirty hippies wearing sandals, the student activist movement at the time sort of started having this attitude where it's like, well, the hippies that we already sort of disagree with for like aesthetic reasons and strategic reasons, you know, maybe like we should just say fuck it and not worry about being labeled that anymore and possibly have some solidarity with it. So it started to create this pushback effect where there were already, you know, the psychedelic drugs, hippies already in San Francisco Hate Ashbury, free love kind of stuff going on. So you started to see this cross influence between the, the student movements and the hippie movement. And by the late 60s, like when you watch these street protests, between, you know, these activists, the movement sort of become indistinguishable, even like the fashion, like just like the way people looked visually, uh, it started to sort of merge. Um, hippie culture... And the student activist culture was kind of almost visually indistinguishable when you watch sort of these videos of uh, these protest marches. Um, towards uh, the end of 67 and 68, that's when black activists like Martin Luther King started also bringing in the war as a plank um, for the movement. You know, this is what we need to remember now. It's like people complaining now saying like, like, and I see a lot of, this is really pisses me off. Like partisan girl. Like, I don't know what her deal is, but I, I think she's honestly like an anti-black racist. I, I have always thought she was sketchy. I don't like her shit. 
Um, I think a lot of the stuff she does on Syria is problematic, even though I'm extremely, extremely against regime change in Syria. Um, but it's like, she's one of these people fueling this idea that it's like, why don't any of these Black Lives Matter protesters care about people, you know, lives Americans kill in other countries or Muslim lives? And it's like, well, how do you know they don't, asshole? Like, you're, that's, you're basically trying to negate black lives or the Black Lives Matter movement as being important by saying, like, these people don't care about this. It's a, it's a total projection, and I think it's really manipulative. And uh, I think that it's actually similar. I mean, all we have to do is look back at, like, even just someone as generic as MLK. He talked about the necessity to bring in a peace block to disrupt the conversation of the 1968 elections. And that peace block was to inject the conversation about the Vietnam War. And he encouraged more war protests as part of the overall conversation on civil rights. I mean, that's the, that's the whole point here. It's like, there's an in here with even the Black Lives Matter movement. If you're a staunch anti-imperialist um, anti-war person but you have this fixation of just refusing to get on board with anything remotely identity politics related including Black Lives Matter then why don't you even just see this as a strategic in like why I don't know why mock people why bash people why judge people why even say like fuck you for not talking about our foreign policy you must not care about black people if you're not talking about the slave markets in Libya like, I've literally seen, like, white supremacist neo-Nazi dog whistlers online saying, like, none of these people care about black people because they're not talking about the slave markets in Libya. Well, it's like, you don't care about the slave markets in Libya either. You think black people are animals. So why would you... It's just such a bizarre thing. Um, so I know I've kind of gone off on a tangent, but what I'm trying to say is that there's an in here that the more momentum a movement like this grows... Even Occupy, there was an in there to widen the conversation and bring people's awareness to war. I mean, young people aren't idiots. They, you know, even people who spend all their time on fucking social media, there is intrinsically a feeling that war is bad. We don't need to kill people in other countries to protect ourselves. Um, I don't think these newer generations have been indoctrinated to the war on terror. Like, like even we have, like people from my generation have been. The Tracy thing is just, I mean, I don't know if he, Tracy's a Nazi. I just think he's a piece of shit. It just shows that he doesn't, he didn't never really had any core morals to begin with and he just blows in the wind he's just a reactionary and it's just it just saddens me because it's like it makes his Russiagate work seem kind of just like a wash it's like who cares he was probably just doing it to be contrarian was his Russiagate work actually that good I mean did you you heard his interview with Alan Dershowitz right you heard his interview with George Papadopoulos right I mean he didn't bring anything new into the equation that would be anything different from like a right wing right talk radio show host would ask someone. So it's like ultimately at the end of the day, it's like, what is the actual value here? I mean, yes, pushing back on Russiagate and the Russian hysteria is extremely important. But like, I mean, if you don't have any moral backbone to you, then it's like, who gives a fuck? You get retweeted by Donald Trump Jr., I mean, and yeah, I mean, like, I even question, it's like, what are, where are Aaron Maté's morals at? If he doesn't even say anything when he gets retweeted by Donald Trump Jr. It's just like, what's up with that bullshit? And yeah, Aaron Maté and Michael Tracy both conceded to the idea that the DNC was probably hacked by the Russians. And I remember hearing them both say that and thinking, like, why would you guys concede the crux to the whole argument? And then now I see both of them being like, Look, we told you, CrowdStrike was wrong. They never had any evidence that the DNC hacked Russia. But you both, you both said that there was, there was evidence that they did. So you both actually conceded the CrowdStrike thing, and now you're acting like you're vindicated? No. Like, what the hell? It's just, it just feels really ladder-climbing. 
and um, and phony. I mean, even look at Greenwald's Russia Gate work. Have you seen how much he's elevating Michael Flynn? It's like. I can't remember the last time Mike uh, Glenn Greenwald talked this much about anyone being unfairly prosecuted by any federal law enforcement agency. It's like he fucking, I mean, it's just, what's his fascination with Michael Flynn? Who cares? Oh yeah, Mate said it years ago. Years ago. Here's the thing. If Eli Lake says that gives you a list of here are the people that were right on Russiagate and that list doesn't include people like Yasha Levine, Mark Ames, Stephen Cohen. I can name a, b- a bunch of other people. Robert Perry. When that list only lists Greenwald, Aaron Mate, Michael Tracy and some other people, you got to wonder... That's the Eli. That's like the that's the Eli Lake safe Russiagate debunker list. That kind of says a lot, actually. Like, I mean, what more do you need to say about that? Eli Lake praising Greenwald. I mean, does that mean Green uh, Eli Lake has somehow evolved and smart now, or does that mean Greenwald has gone down the tubes? Probably the latter. Sorry, I just went off like a a string of of personal. <laughs> Um, I was going to say personal attacks, but I'm, I'm really attacking actually like their behavior and their content, I'm not even attacking their person, them personally. Um, so let's get back to the, let's get back to the story. So uh, the Berkeley protesters you know, and this is already starting around the country at other colleges as well. Student activists trying to stop draft centers, trying to stop people from going, you know, walking into the draft office. People getting called into the draft, having to be called in, you know, like bust in and sent off to an army base. Uh, the protesters were trying to stop this. And uh, it was still relatively peaceful. Like they didn't even like, physically stand in the way of the doors they just sort of stood in a line and yelled you know don't go to these people getting drafted you don't have to go don't go um there's a video in berkeley in the 60s of a of a guy who was going into the draft beating up trying to beat up one of the protesters like getting really upset at him um because yeah i mean imagine the cognitive dissonance that some of these people were under. It's like, they're literally being sent in like lambs, like lambs to the slaughter. And here are all these like students, some of them maybe even younger than them protesting, saying like, don't go, don't do this. And they felt like they had to because they were legally obligated to. Right. Um, So at this time, this is when you started to see like early counter protesting techniques or sort of um, protesters using counter policing techniques like wearing army helmets. Uh, Berkeley student organizers started to encourage people to buy supplies at army surplus stores like helmets because police were using batons and beating people over the heads during some of these protests, even though they were largely peaceful. They were marches. They weren't really even doing civil disobedience at this time. So the protest movement, I think at that time felt very disillusioned because nobody like they didn't get encourage anybody to not go into the draft. They felt like they were totally unsuccessful um, they didn't feel like they were aggressive enough. So their idea was now we have to raise the stakes. We have to just make a, bring a lot more focus to this issue. So 
the next protests that the Berkeley students organized um, were, were basically street battles, uh, protesters versus the police. But they actually got the police to fully retreat this time. There's video of the police like fully retreating, riot police. And uh, this gave the protesters a shitload of hope. It was sort of like a couple days before they were totally hopeless because every single person that was going into the draft office went in. They didn't stop anybody. They didn't get anybody to turn away. And then this time they actually got the police to fall back. And they were able to control the entire area of downtown Oakland for the whole day. So, and at this time, you know, same debate was being had. Local Bay Area people uh, were saying that even though they supported the, the movement and wanted to stop the war, they hated the protesters because they broke things like picket fences in people's front yards. Um, one of the protest leaders actually knifed the tires of a district attorney, judge's car. They spray painted buildings, things like that. A lot of the same things that we see now. And there was actually, in the movie, they touch on this conversation that I guess took place in the White House where Lyndon Johnson was told he wanted to add one million more soldiers to the Vietnam War in 1966. And he was told by his advisors that if the U.S. added one million more soldiers to the Vietnam War, that the domestic situation in the United States would become unstable because of what was already happening with this low, lower level protest movement that hadn't really exploded yet, but it was sort of at a low, low level. Now, the Black Panthers got formed by two Oakland college students, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, in 1966. And one of their rationales for starting the Black Panther Party was that if the sort of forced upon our society and the Vietnamese people violence of the Vietnam War and the draft by forcing Americans to serve in this war, um, because of that, because that was sort of forced upon us, that's a rationale for upping the stakes against the systematic injustice because they are forcing us to commit injustice and their injustices being committed on the Vietnamese people, it was completely within the black civil rights leaders' rights to up the stakes themselves. Um, and they saw Vietnam as a direct rationale for doing that. Um, if they're going to throw into a meat grinder people, including our brothers and sisters, our black brothers and sisters, who they already treat like garbage, then why should we not up the stakes to protect our own people? Um, so that was, I mean, I, I think people need to understand how much the war was tied into this. I think right now, this is one thing I think would give people maybe a little bit of optimism for the situation right now. If the Iraq war was just starting like a year ago or two years ago, I think we could have another sort of 60s style, um, mass movement on our hands potentially. Now, obviously, the inclusion of the Civil Rights Era, the Civil Rights Act, was a big part of that, too. This was, it was sort of all things coalescing at once in the 60s, but I think that the idea of like endless war is just not enough. There's not enough American soldiers dying. We don't see evidence of the carnage we caused with our bombs. It's so detached. You know, we use drones now. We need to figure out a way to bring that conversation back up again, I think. And maybe the easiest way to do it is just to show, you know, civilian casualties or the amount of people that we kill um, or the amount of money that we spend. I mean, I know those are obvious things, but I, I think that's the best we can do right now. I don't think there's just not enough attention. There's not enough. There's not something like the Iraq war happening right now to wake people up to the extent that the Vietnam War did back then, and the draft. I mean, that was obviously a huge component to it. Um,
what is the next right step after the BLM protest, says Matt's. I mean, it kind of seems like things skipped forward past, you know, there isn't like a major war maybe that they that it make feels like it could be protested against right now um, by people, but there's an autonomous zone in Seattle right now, which is interesting because that was sort of the culmination of the Berkeley protest movement in a weird way. Um, cre- creating a little bit of an autonomous zone for themselves. So that's where this podcast is leading. I'm, I'm going to, I'll wrap it up pretty quickly here. I'll just go into the rest of this history. Um, the original Black Panthers from Oakland, they actually used sales of the Little Red Book by Mao to raise money to buy their first firearm. So they went to Chinatown and bought copies of the book for like 10 cents a copy and would sell it for a dollar to the white Berkeley students on campus. Um, and it worked. They, they raised enough money to buy shotguns, distribute enough of them to the other people that wanted to become part of their group. And in 1967, the Black Panthers marched on the Capitol uh, to essentially stop a, uh, a legal movement from lawmakers to try to disarm them specifically. Even though the law didn't specifically mention them in it, it was designed to stop the Black Panthers from basically being armed. So they actually got to the second floor of the Capitol building in California. Uh, they got charged with conspiracy and felonies. And uh, they actually used legal gun owners' rights at the time to go inside the Capitol building. They were not breaking any laws. And uh, it didn't matter, of course, because they were black. It was too scary to allow an armed black man to go inside the Capitol building. And then they were arrested and they put trumped up charges against them. And then, there, you know, then we started to see basically all-out war waged against the Black Panthers by the police. Um, Huey Newton was arrested for suspected murder after an alleged shootout with police a police officer was killed and at this time sort of the white far left in the united states and especially in berkeley embraced the black panthers because in some ways they sort of envied them and they projected the level of sort of intensity and passion (laughs) Uh, that they were always trying to. And uh, there were maybe some experienced activists who were part of sort of the original Berkeley group from the beginning who didn't love what the Black Panthers were doing. They felt that um, they wanted to be critical, but they also felt that if they criticized them openly in public, uh, they would be, um, you know, people would look at them badly because that's how much power and, uh, and love and support that the Black Panthers had at this time. And we also hear similar talk now where it's like, you know, it's like, well, I had to get out of the protest movement because, you know, nobody listened to me about like stopping the black block people from breaking windows. So it's like if you're willing to throw if you're so committed to the protest movement, but that's when you stop supporting it, maybe you really weren't that committed to it in the first place. Like if that's your main concern. I mean, have you seen the protests in other countries like France? That shit's a tradition. They always break stuff. I mean, it just, I just think Americans, maybe soon they will get used to like what, um, what this could look like or what this is supposed to look like and what, you know, is, uh, sort of worth the cost of doing in terms of like property damage and stuff. So two days after MLK was assassinated, there was another alleged shootout between Black Panthers and Oakland police, uh, resulting in the deaths of another Black Panther member, Bobby Hutton, on April 6, 1968. And by 1968, there was protest movements springing up all over the world. Um, They were in the UK. There was the Paris protest movement. There was the Prague Spring. Um... Women's liberation started to become a protest movement. Black liberation, anti-war, anti-police. This was all sort of, you know, springing up everywhere at this point. And in 
And around this time, there were the protests at Berkeley started to really go, go in full swing again, and police and students started to battle on a daily basis. I mean, it went on for apparently eight weeks straight, um, and it was about all different types of issues. It was about having some kind of ethnic studies program on campus, um, recognizing people of color. So these were things that, like, you know, back then transposed them to today. And, you know, a lot of right wingers would say, well, that's like identity politics or, you know, SJWs. Um, but these were things that were also important for people in the 60s. And uh, Ronald Reagan, as governor, called the National Guard out to crush these protests. And uh, so the students felt, you know, that they had already injected a lot of energy into the war protests, the civil rights protests. And at this point, it's sort of their protests almost turned inward towards their own local authorities, which were essentially the administration, uh, the college dean and the administration authorities um, at the college, the university. So what they did was, um, and they were also just really upset that the National Guard got called out to crush these protests that were happening on campus. So the students found a park or a plot of land a few blocks away from the university that was fenced off and was university property that had just been vacant for like several years. It was just this empty lot. And students decided that um, because the university had treated them so poorly and because the university had decided to allow the National Guard in to come in and beat the shit out of them and crush their protest movement, that they would take a piece of the university for themselves that wasn't being used. And that was coined People's Park. They took this plot of land. Um, I want to guesstimate in my mind, because I don't know exactly how big it is, but if I'm, in my mind, I'd say it's about maybe 500 by 1,000 feet. It's a small little plot of land. Um, and these protesters took the park, occupied it, um, laid down grass. Uh, they planted gardens. Um, they started having like communal cookouts, uh, parties, um, meetings for other protests. And it seemed like this sort of utopian thing where uh, it was like all these hippies, you know, from San Francisco and from from all over the place started to come and like join the students and sort of this communal show of force against the university and just against authority in general. So this the reason that this I decided to do this episode today is because even though it maybe, you know, seemed trivial or even like maybe silly to some people that these activists actually managed to take a piece of Seattle a few blocks in Seattle for themselves. It's actually like historically relevant. Um, it's an important part of, of protest movements, including the Vietnam war protest movement. And it will also be probably crushed with overwhelming force. And that's one thing. I mean, if the police and the government of Seattle and Washington are optically smart, they're going to try to crush it quietly. Otherwise, if Trump or a Ronald Reagan like figure involved in this has too big of an ego, um, they might, it might blow up in their face. If they try to go in there with like armed guards, there's a lot of armed people right now in this little Chaz autonomous zone. It's a little more militarized than even People's Park um, was. So several weeks after People's Park was taken, the university decided to come in with police, riot police, dogs, kicked all the protesters out, steamrolled over, over everything, tore up all the grass, turned it back into a dirt lot. Um, now at this point, even some people who are sympathetic with some of the activists, like even some of the student faculty were like, now the students have gone too far. Like they've already, they've ran out of ideas of things to protest. And now they're just like running 
they they have all this like momentum, but they don't have any like actual ideas of what they want to fight against now. So now they're just like occupying this park. Like, what is this bullshit? Like, fuck these people now. Like, a lot of people actually jumped off the bus at this point and thought that it was dumb. Um, but a lot of other people didn't and thought that it was extremely important. It was an extremely important symbolic gesture. And which it was, because it sort of enshrined the Berkeley protest movement in history forever. Someone was actually murdered. A bystander of the final confrontation between the National Guard and the police with the protest at People's Park resulted in the murder of a bystander by police with live ammunition Live ammunition. Uh, Ronald Reagan um, and other local authorities encouraged the police to use any means necessary to stop the protest at this time. It was basically a symbolic show of force to say that you have crossed the line. You can protest the war. You can protest, you know, for civil rights. You can protest for whatever you want. But as soon as you steal property, because that's essentially how they saw it, as you stole property, you are thieves and you need to be prosecuted, you are now criminals and can be shot at. Like, I think that was sort of the rationale at the time. So the story goes, James Rector, um, this is from Wikipedia, um, he was sitting on top of the repertory cinema so there were people, there were bystanders who were sitting on top of buildings. It was such a big march and protest that like, you know, there's people sitting on top of buildings. And of course, to a crazy bootlicking sheriff armed with a shotgun and armed with the license to murder protesters, saw this dude sitting on a rooftop, top of the cinema on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley and blew him the fuck away with a shotgun. Uh, James Rector um, was shot and killed uh, at this protest. And they claim, the police and the university authorities claim that James threw rebar down on the police, that he threw rebar down at them. Um, but according to like pretty much every historical account and every investigation since, he was a bystander. He was not a protester. He was just watching. He didn't throw anything. They murdered him. Um, also, a local carpenter in Berkeley, Alan Blanchard, was also not a bur uh, by, uh, protester. He was a bystander. He was blinded permanently uh, by buckshot shot from a shotgun into his face. So these were, I guess they used buckshot. So they didn't use like regular shotgun shell ammunition. And that's how they justified it as it wasn't. So I guess back then, this was their version of non-lethal rounds. Um, so 128 Berkeley residents were admitted to local hospitals for head trauma, shotgun wounds, and other serious injuries inflicted by police. And because Reagan had cracked down so hard this time, most of the injured people that were reported did not actually seek hospital treatment because they knew that if they did, they'd be immediately arrested and charged. Yeah, and then on Wikipedia, of course, it's funny to see what the edits are here because someone obviously, like, some pro-police jackass came in here and tried to, like, push an argument that, like, a bunch of police got injured on the Wikipedia article that says... It says some local hospitals indicate that 19 police officers of Alameda County Sheriff's Dep deputies were treated for minor injuries. None were hospitalized. Um, so that evening, I mean, Reagan sent in almost 3000 National Guard troops. And during this um, People's Park incident, they call it, I think it's also called Bloody Thursday. Um the police claimed that hippies were trying to poison them with LSD, which was never proven. And local police came into People's Park at night in plain clothes, dressed in Halloween pig masks. This really happened. Local police came in at night 
stealth like invaded people's park and beat people with batons in Halloween pig masks. I don't think there's any photographs of this that any people were able to take at the time, but this actually happened. This was multiple witnesses saw this. It's been historically documented. Now, the protesters got so fed up, you know, with this extreme crazy crackdown that they fucking stormed the Berkeley campus, a huge outpouring of support, probably the biggest Berkeley campus protest yet. And it was actually a peaceful protest this time. Like when they went on campus, they weren't breaking shit. They weren't demanding, um, you know, they weren't trying to storm another building. They were just occupying the whole campus. A a police officer got on a loudspeaker and announced that chemical agents were going to be dispersed. And of course, these protesters had already been used to tear gas. It wasn't anything new to them. You know, there's video footage of even people in the earliest student protests throwing tear gas canisters back at local Berkeley police. That was what they thought they were going to be encountered with. No big deal, right? Wrong. Uh, What happened next was they all heard a chopper, military chopper, flying above them. And some of the protesters actually for a second, they thought that they were literally going to be machine gunned down on the Berkeley campus. That's how crazy the National Guard response and crackdown by Ronald Reagan had been um, the previous nights. That there were some protesters who thought they were actually going to be gunned down. But what happened next was even weirder. The helicopter dispersed from its own, like, I don't know what you would call it, like crop duster canisters. Like, the helicopter itself this military helicopter does a low swoop down on the berkeley campus over all the protesters and tear gases everyone it's a crazy scene there's video footage of a helicopter coming and tear gassing the entire campus um and i think i mean in this movie the sort of the the portrayal is that this made everybody super disillusioned this was like the end of the era. They felt that they were like their souls had been crushed. How are they ever going to build up momentum again for this movement? Um, but it's interesting because that was the response to People's Park, essentially, was Reagan was like, I'm not fucking around anymore. 3,000 National Guard. Pol- send poli- you know, police in with pig masks. The police lying about hippies battling them with LSD. Um citizens being shot with buckshot hundreds of Berkeley citizens going to the hospital for shotgun wounds. I mean, this is absolutely crazy. And depending on what happens now with Seattle, this could be the situation in the Seattle autonomous zone soon. So if we want to see what's going, you know, what the next stage of this movement could be, it could be this. And as silly and as, you know, maybe, I don't know if you don't have solidarity with it or whatever, and you think it's silly that I, I it's fine. That's fine. I can understand, but you might find yourself soon having some solidarity with it in a very strong way. If there is some kind of excessive military or local law enforcement force used to clean, clear up that area. Because to me, Capturing a local police precinct in Seattle, that's a bigger deal than just capturing a plot of land that's owned by the university. This is kind of on a different level. So, um, Thanks. Thanks to, for saying cool no mo go shirt. Um I guess that's the end of my story. I mean I, I know I just sort of like petered out at the end, but the reason I'm telling you all this today is because I think to try to encourage you to have solidarity with any movement where police cars are being turned over in the street and police are being like chased away by like massive marches of people. That's a, that's a pretty optimistic thing. 
Um, and the conversation could get broader, just like what MLK did. He didn't make it all about the struggle of, for black civil rights. He started to bring in the Vietnam War. He started to bring in the class struggle. I mean, these were things that they took a while to build up, but that's where they all, they all sort of came together. Um, so yeah, I just don't think you should be that worried about a Wendy's being burnt down. I just do not think it, it's really not that big of a deal. And I'm also telling this story to remind you how much the right has co-opted, not just co-opted the energy of acting like they're really concerned about free speech, but they've co-opted the history and they've actually erased the history of left activism. They've deliberately tried to remove things that are really, really key to like these left activist movements and make them their own, to pretend that they're their own, to pretend that they don't have roots in left activism. So it, that's just another clear indication that they are grifters. They're just using the things that actually work from the left and that capture people's attention for their own agenda. I mean, that's what they're doing. That's what Tucker Carlson does. I mean, I'm sorry, but if you're still watching Tucker Carlson at this point and you think he's actually like pushing against the establishment, you're just fucking stupid. And I recommend you not watch my show or listen to Media Roots Radio. I'm kind of just like over that shit. I'm not even like... I don't even have the patience anymore to try to make you understand why you're wasting your time and why you're actually helping prop up someone who's really dangerous. So, let's do a little nom, right? Yeah, the protests need direction. I mean, all protests need direction, but if life is a leaf, I mean, that was sort of, I think, that was the criticism that people said about the people, the culmination of People's Park was that this is what happens when the protests don't have direction is they just want to steal shit now. You know, they just want to steal this piece of land. Look at these hippies. So I would be worried less about the direction and more worried, more hopeful about the fact that people understand that Dr. shit is Arnold fucked up. Like, you don't necessarily need a direction to take that into. Yet, I don't think. And I think that that, I mean, that can come later. <clears throat> so here we go. Go up the Yon River. To oh my God, this is awful. Guard. Awful voiceovers, dude. Okay, so remember I told you that this game doesn't make any sense for being the Vietnam War? So, first of all, did the Viet Cong have tanks? I don't think they had helicopters. Did the Viet Cong have helicopters? Okay, so I'm fighting. This game's hard. Oh, shit! You fucking asshole. This game is not easy. Shit! Ah, oh, shit. Ah! Ah! That animation when he dies is great. Why is the animation, some of the animation amazing, but others really bad? It's 
Wow, I'm bad at this. It takes a certain level of uh, coordination because you have to run. If you're shooting, you can't move. So you have to choose between either moving out of the way or shooting. It's kind of a weird... I actually used to have... Whoa, shit. Believe it or not, I know I look like this is the first time I played this game. I used to own a Neo Geo cartridge system. Um, and it came with this game. It came with NOM. NOM 75. Fuck. Dude. Ah! Wow, that's a really racist looking... Is that supposed to be a Vietnamese guy? What the fuck is happening? What the hell is going on, dude? So I can shoot the statue now? So basically you're like the Taliban, you blow up the statue to beat the level? What the hell? Weird. That's so bizarre. This is Firebird. Headquarters. Over. We This game is stupid. Like, why does it why is it even called NOM 75? Like, it doesn't even make sense. Am I supposed to even be fighting the Viet Cong? I, I seriously don't even understand. Do you guys know? Stupid game. Okay. Sounds like the music in um, MacGruber when he puts the celery in his ass and starts dancing around. Isn't it? Shit! So look at. I have a blonde woman scantily clad in like a dress with a very perfectly outlined ass in her dress, shooting, helping me shoot. Weird. What? Oh, you should see MacGruber. MacGruber's awesome. I feel like this game was not even about Vietnam when they made it originally. Does anything about this game, other than the name and the, and the splash screens and the main character's color, remind you of Vietnam? Like, what about this game? I mean, it just feels like a game that they... What the fuck? fucking sucks. I mean, I think it'll be fun with two players, though. I should have maybe saved this one for a me and Lori episode.
So just in case you didn't know, Neo Geo, as terms of a home console system, was one of the only other systems that used as much FM synthesis as the Sega Genesis. Wow, that's a really good looking fire animation. They had um they had a better sound chip than Genesis though. That's why the samples sound so much cleaner in this. Shit. Oh, I got burnt that time. Fuck. Wow. Like how fast the animation is. That's cool how like smooth some of these animations are. These SNK games had a really nice um I don't know. I like programming. I don't know how they made the some of these animations are neat looking. It would make a lot more sense if the player was Viet Cong. Good point. Exactly. Okay. I'm just going to play with the second player just so I can... Um... I'm going to see if I can do double. Wait, can it? Is this be easy to do? No, probably not. Huh? Oh, shit. No, this is too hard. I play to play with the two players at the same time. Have you ever tried to set up the same controller on an emulator for like two players on one of these kind of games where you where the other player like directly does the exact same movements? It's kind of a funny way to play any two player co-op game. It works especially well on the Ninja Turtles beat 'em up games for arcade. Yeah. <laughs> These games are about making dollars, not cents. That's true. Fair point. It is true that capitalism is what motivates. Nice uh, hammer and sickle, though. So it's like a giant, like, uh, I guess, is this the Viet Cong? Is this supposed to be Russia? I like that damage, though. Look at that shit. Oh, that's nice damage. Dude, that's a nice... For a game from 1989 with that kind of battle damage? That's fucking cool. Okay. I can kind of understand why this game has some clout. That battle damage animation, that's good. Some good battle damage. Especially to wait for the third boss to show me that battle damage, I'm, I'm pleased. Because they must have worked really hard on that. I've never seen anything like that for a game from this time period. Have you seen battle damage like this on a game from 1989? Look at that. Look at that shit. I'm shooting like bullet holes everywhere I shoot in this thing. It's so cool. I'm sorry, I keep dying. I just want to show you that some more. Um. They actually, you know, it's funny. Someone said this is basically Platoon the game. Believe it or not, they are, there is a Platoon game for the original NES. There's, like, several NES games that are, like, of not even, like, horror movies. Because that makes more sense. Like, it makes more sense for a, an original NES game to be, like, a Friday the 13th or um, Freddy Krueger. 
because you know kids even though they were probably like not allowed to go see those movies as kids they still were into those properties like it would still was still cool but like what kid was into like dirty harry or platoon which they both made nes games out of look it up right now they're actual nes cartridges for the original nintendo made of the film dirty harry and the oliver stone film platoon I know that Abby talks to Oliver Stone sometimes or um, that she's met him back in the day. And I've always wanted her to ask him the next time she gets a chance to speak to him. Hey, Oliver, what did you get any money off the back end of that platoon NES game? <laughs> how much mo- How much did you get in licensing for that? Did you get anything for that? Did Charlie Sheen get like, did any of the actors get anything from that? Cause there's, I think I mentioned this before on this show that, um, there's a very distinct difference now between like, they've always figured out a way to not give actors in movies licensing money for their characters. Like Macaulay Culkin would get money for like home alone games and stuff like that. But like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I don't think got money for the predator. Cause like, he's not the character in the game. Does that make sense? Um, but like newer games, like the last of us, you know, actually have like a full scan face of like a mainstream, you know, the, the, the actor from the walking dead, for example, he's the main character of last of us. They did a really good job trying to make him look like trying to make the main character in the video game look exactly like the actor. So it's almost just like an actor starring in a video game. That's how they do it now. But before they try to do like sneaky shit where they would actually like not get real licensing deals with the celebrity and try to sneak out like a weird adaptation of like a movie. Um, oh man, talk radio video game would have been amazing. That movie is a beautiful mess. I love aspects of it, but man, some of that Alec Baldwin behind the scenes... The movie would have almost been perfect. Well, I haven't seen the play either. I know it's based on a play. But so maybe it's not the fault of the movie, but the play or the movie I thought always would have been perfect had it all it just completely taken place inside the radio show broadcast. Like almost like you only saw the other characters through the control room or like over the mic talking back to him, but you never saw him actually leave the studio maybe until the very, very, very end of the the story. I always thought that would have been a stronger story. So I don't know if that's in the play or not, but the movie has a lot of like weird filler scenes where he's arguing with his girlfriend and Alec Baldwin, like his boss. And it, um, They actually copied the ending for the Platoon NES game? Weird. Ahmet, you mean like photographically? Like is there a picture of like from the movie or something? Uh, I have not seen Robin Hood on the NES, but that makes sense because Kevin Costner was so expensive at that time. He was such an in-demand hot actor that I think he was actually the highest paid actor in Hollywood at that time after Dances with Wolves that he probably like was, would have demanded like a million millions of dollars from Nintendo or whatever company put that out. So, so yeah, they make a, they make a gamble. It's like, it's like they can use the movie poster. It's like the platoon game and the dirty Harry game, like use the movie poster, but I don't know if like it's Clint Eastwood is like credited in it. I don't know. It'd be interesting to look at all these games and see what the hell was actually like done. For each one. Um, I'm getting a little little tired. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode of Main Politics. I know this is a little different. I didn't interact too much with the chat. But um, every Monday I'm going to be doing... Covering a different topic that I feel like talking about. And sometimes they'll be just totally different things. Um, somebody suggested that it would be good if I did an episode of like 10 of my favorite albums of all time, music albums or something completely unrelated to politics. Um, just cause we've sometimes talked about music and electronic music in here. So I thought that might be cool. 
uh, and might I also be cool to tell everybody to watch a movie? We can have sort of a um, a discussion about a movie at a certain point, like that. Um, I just watched a, a really one of my favorite movies again uh, that I think I've already mentioned in here, called Upstream Come uh, Upstream Color. Um, and uh, yeah, so if anybody hasn't seen Upstream Color, maybe we could talk about that on the next episode. And um, what the director of that movie has in store next. Um, he's a pretty brilliant dude. He's the guy who made Primer, if you haven't seen that. It's like one of the most impressive indie, indie sci-fi films. He doesn't fall into some of the same art house movie tropes that other filmmakers do. Um, I have really specific tastes when it comes to those kind of movies, and this guy really resonates with me as a filmmaker. Um. No, I have not tried Streets of Rage 4, but I, I will and try to get somebody from in here to do co-op play with me while we're doing it. That would be fun. And maybe actually someone to come in on camera, too. Um, so I'm not that's not an open invitation to everyone in the chat. Some of you I know better than others. So I will, you know, maybe if, if someone, one of you guys wants to contact me about that, maybe we could set that up. But wanna wanna talk about one other game uh, that if you have not heard of it, it's fucking crazy amazing. Like I, I was I'm shocked I haven't heard of this before. So I randomly came across um a video called Examples of Great Level Design. And in the video, it's just some guy playing what looks like a three dimensional Sonic game that I thought when I saw it it was for like the Sega Saturn. And as I was watching the video, I was thinking, this is such an incredible Sonic the Hedgehog game transported into 3D that how come I've never heard of this before? Like, this is almost like better than Mario 64 in terms of Mario jumping into the 3D realm. Like, how is this game not more talked about? What Sonic game is this? What the fuck is this? Because I had played Sonic the Hedgehog games for Sega Saturn or 3D Sonic games, and they were all mostly shitty. Like, all of them were pretty bad. And this one looked amazing. But what I found out about it is it was never released commercially. It's actually a fan-made game that was made a few years ago called Sonic Robo Blast 2. Wait a second. Oh, okay. So actually, Google says something different than I thought was slightly different. Um, Sonic Robo Blast was an early Sonic fan game from 1998. So I guess it was like a 2D game. I have never played that. Sonic Robo Blast 2 is a fully 3D game that is superior to any commercially available Sonic the Hedgehog 3D game that Sega ever released. Um, go watch a video of Sonic Robo Blast 2 right now, and if you are if you like Sonic or if you've ever wanted to play like a good Sonic 3D game, you might be shocked of how good this looks. Like, they actually... It has all the original sound effects from the Genesis games in it. The levels are huge. For being like 3D levels, you move so fast and so quick, quickly through them that it's like... It's just a really interesting kind of level design where it's almost like a racetrack style level design in 3D, but way bigger and more intricate than a racetrack. And um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to play that pretty soon on this because I just want an excuse to play it and it looks fucking awesome. And as always, um, if you want to get access to all the episodes of Main Politics, um, this one that we're watching now and the previous episode will both be unlocked. They will both be available to everybody. But the next few episodes, maybe the next two, I will probably make them for patrons only after they air. So anybody can watch them streaming, but after they air, um, you will only have access to them if you are a Patreon subscriber of mine. So consider chipping in five bucks a month to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Robbie Martin. And, uh, 
yeah, you'll get access to that. And also, if you become a Patreon subscriber of mine, and sorry I haven't posted this yet. I'm, I'm going to do it shortly. You will also get access to a free music album by Dusty Cart, a.k.a. Brian Ellis, the composer of my theme song uh, for Main Politics, the new theme song. It's all FM synthesizer, arcade, Genesis-style retro video game music. Um, you guys would probably dig the sound this this album if you like it. So if you want access to that, um, you can also become a Patreon subscriber of mine. And Brian Ellis was nice enough to provide a download code for that to my subscribers. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. And uh, yeah, take care. Talk to you soon.